Good morning. Welcome to Chapel at the Institute of Lutheran Theology. Timothy Swenson is my name, and I come to you from Arnegard, North Dakota. As we begin today, let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, your kindness caused the light of the gospel to shine among us. Extend your mercy now, we pray, to all the people of the world who do not have hope in Jesus Christ, that your salvation may be known to them also, and that all hearts would turn to you. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The word today is from Jonah chapters 3 and 4. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for what you did not labor and what you did not grow, it came to being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than a 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? And also, many animals. The Word of the Lord. Greetings to you. Greetings on this day that the Lord has made a day for us to rejoice and be glad. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. When God saw what Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. I can point to the Ten Commandments. You can point to the Ten Commandments, and we can agree that God has some clear expectations about human behavior. Expectations of proper behavior about and rejection of improper behavior. These agreed upon expectations God has regarding humanity naturally turn us to ourselves asking, am I properly behaved or not? So occupied with that question, humanity spends little time questioning its expectations of God. 
That's up to theologians and preachers, the professional ones like you and I, and the occasional ones like Jonah. Jonah had walked through the city of Nineveh preaching a very simple sermon. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The people heard. The people believed. The city repented. God relented. Punishment withheld. Jonah displeased. Don't you have to think here that Jonah's a pretty odd preacher? Well, besides that whole belly of the whale thing, I mean, the people believed the people of Nineveh, that exceedingly large city, three days walk across the people of Nineveh, believed. One preacher, one sermon, one sentence long, and tens of thousands of people believed. Measured against success like that, every other preacher sense can only come up short. But it was Jonah's success that displeased him the most. As Christians, we tend to think of the Apostle Paul as preacher to the Gentiles. Jonah, though, precedes Paul by many centuries and preaches not to mere Gentiles, but enemy Gentiles. Assyrians, whose empire overshadowed Israel, then threatened it, and then conquered it, dispersing its people, Jonah's people. Nineveh was the capital of Syria. Jonah, who preached its destruction, proved to be the agent of salvation for his and his people's enemy. No wonder Jonah's success displeased him so much. So much that in his anger he lamented to God, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. Before before even there was a cross, God was making a theologian of the cross out of Jonah. In the Heidelberg Disputations, Martin Luther made three assertions distinguishing theologians of the cross from theologians of glory. Number one, that person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things which have actually happened. Number two, He deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering and the cross. Number three, a theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. Simply put, a theologian of glory looks for God to be justified by his deeds. That is, by God's visible and manifest works. A theologian of the cross waits for God to be justified in his words. That is, through God's preached word of law and gospel command and promise. Like all humanity, Jonah was a natural theologian of glory. He was born to it. All humans are born to it, and they really can't be taught otherwise. Theologians of the cross must be born as well. Born of the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, as it works through the Word to give new birth. In his displeasure and anger, Jonah had gone off in a huff, lamenting to God a righteous, I told you so, Jonah pointed an accusing finger of blame at God for his own now miserable existence. It is better for me to die than to live. Jonah is so thoroughly curved in upon himself that he can't even enjoy his success as a preacher. No, it has to be on Jonah's terms 
on his expectations of God and God's glory. Jonah is a theologian of glory, preferring to die if God won't be justified by his deeds. So God goes to work to bring about the death of Jonah's old theologian and the birth of a new theologian, a theologian of the cross. So here's Ole going over to talk to his friend Lars. He gets there and he says, Lars, I need some help. I think I'm depressed. What can you say to me? Lars says, Ole, every time I think I might be depressed, I just say to myself, Lars, cheer up. It could be worse. Oh, thanks, Lars. I'll try it. Ole replies, and off he goes. A couple days later, Lars meets Ole and asks him how his depression is. Ole answers, Oh, what you told me was so true! I cheered up! And sure enough, things got worse. God doesn't seek to cheer up Jonah's anger. He questions it. He intensifies it. When Jonah insists on his right to be angry and blame God, jo God turns to a very obvious object lesson. God uses a little plant to intensify Jonah's anger. He's angry enough to die. So God drives him down to the dust with this humiliating juxtaposition. You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons? Jonas, being curved in upon himself, is exposed in the juxtaposition of his concern for a little bush against God's concern for the enormous city. Jonah's theologian of glory, the one whose finger of anger and blame had pointed at God, that theologian has gone down to the dust, and from that humiliation arises a new theologian, born of God's word, a theologian of the cross. The word from Isaiah echoes here, Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Hans Ewand, a German theologian of the 20th century, once declared that the first justification that takes place in justification by faith is the justification of God. That is, sinners, rather than blaming God as the cause of their problem, now see that God is justified in his word, this, his judgment against them. God is just in his judgment of them. These sinners, justified by faith, no longer blame God for their difficulty. They are blameless. Presumably then, these justified sinners no longer blame creation or neighbor, and so are blameless before them as well. God is just in his word of mercy to them. They have been justified, reborn as theologians of the, of the cross, no longer theologians of glory. Jonah teaches you something about success. However much you may desire it and even achieve it, like Jonah did, Success will never satisfy, it will never be yours as a theologian of glory until that accusing finger of blame bypasses neighbor, creation, and creator and points solely at yourself. Then, even a one-sentence sermon is effective and you join Nineveh in repentance abjectly and honestly confessing both failures and successes, you come to know not the success of your own work, but the success of God's work in you, the successful birth 
of a theologian of the cross. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your word endures throughout, though our mortal flesh flourishes and withers. So send your word among us upon the lips of preachers that we would hear and believe as your Holy Spirit works faith. Then hold us in that faith of Christ so we might endure the flourishing and withering of our own flesh and the rise and fall of generations until that day when faith shall turn to sight. Heavenly Father, put your word in the ears of those who are of the Institute, its staff, faculty, students, and congregations. Give them such ears to hear that they will become preachers of the word they have heard, delivering it as law and gospel to still more ears until the ends of the earth have been reached. Heavenly Father, so give your word free reign upon this world, that as it is heard and preached and preached and heard, all of this creation will be rightly ordered beneath it, and the new creation in Jesus Christ be delivered in it. All these things we give over into your hands, trusting in the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.